Amen. Amen. Greetings in the name of Jesus. If you are here for the first time, can you raise your hand? Let me just see who's here for the first time. Wow. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's good. Glad that you could join us here for the first time. Um, obviously, you will find that our service is a little bit different than others. Two reasons why we invited you here this evening. Number one, we want to exalt Jesus Christ. We want to exalt Him before you tonight. And number two, we want you to consider the way that you are on. We want you to consider whether you are on the right path. And so you can turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 1. The first Psalm. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. It's a very famous Psalm. Let me read it and then I'll pray. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. And we are thankful for your word, O oh God. And now we bring ourselves before you, Lord, and we declare that we are worthless. There's nothing in us. There's nothing we can do to bring pleasure to you except through Jesus Christ. It's only in him that we are found to be blessed. It's only in Christ that we are found to be the righteousness of God. O oh God, all things in this world is meaningless without Christ. You are highly exalted. You are worthy of our worship and you are worthy of our devotion. You are worthy of the, of the worship of every single person here this evening. And so we lift ourselves up before you and, and we say, Lord, we are insufficient for these things. Who can make these dry bones live but you? And so we ask for your spirit. We ask that you would move in power. We ask, Lord, that you will convict the hearts of sinners. And Lord, that the saints will glory in the exaltation of Jesus who saved us. And so as we approach the psalm, Lord, speak into our hearts in the name of Jesus. All of the scriptures, the whole Bible, everything points to you, Jesus. So be glorified in our midst. We ask this for the sake of your honor and your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now Jesus, after his resurrection, walks with two very disheartened disciples on the road of Emmaus. Who knows that story? Do you know that story? Where Jesus walks with these two disciples and they are troubled in their hearts because the Messiah, the one they thought would save and deliver them, he was just killed. They hung him on the cross, they tortured him and they were disheartened. And it's the third day. And suddenly, a stranger will appear among them and walk with them. And Jesus, as he walks with them, he hears their conversation and he rebukes them for their unbelief. He rebukes them and he, he tells them this in, in Luke 24 verse 27. The Bible says, he opens up their hearts, his, their eyes, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
Jesus shows to these two disheartened disciples that all the scriptures points to him and that he is the fulfillment of all of scripture. In the same chapter of Luke, Jesus appears to his fearful and grieving disciples of his resurrection. Now these two disciples might have been part of these ones that were cowering in a room. They are hiding away because they're afraid and their Messiah was just killed. And Jesus appears to them in this closed room. He shows them his hands and, and his feet and, and then he eats a meal with them. And then he said to them, in Luke 24 verse 44, he says, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Jesus is telling them that all of scripture talks about me. This is what I've been telling you the whole time. And someone rightly said that the entire Bible is about one person, one plan, and one purpose. That person is Jesus Christ. The plan is redemption. And the purpose is the glory of God. Jesus Christ really is the point of the whole Bible. Listen to what he says to the Pharisees who studied the scriptures from a small, from a young age. He tells the Pharisees in John 5 verse 39, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Now there are many of us that search the scriptures. We read the Bible. But if that Bible you are reading, if the reading of the word is not pointing you to Jesus... If it's not testifying of Christ, then you are being led astray. The Old Testament points to Jesus Christ as the only true judge, the only true righteous one, the only perfect prophet, priest, and king. He is the fulfillment of the law, the only lasting and perfect sacrifice whose blood cleanses us from all sins once and for all, forever. He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13 verse 8 says. Jesus really is the point of every book in the Bible, and every book of the Bible points to Him, especially the Psalms. The book of Psalms, that we just wrote now, Psalm 1, the whole book is both a hymnal and a prayer journal that is devoted to the worship and adoration of Almighty God and His coming Messiah, Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. The Psalms points us to Jesus through whom final redemption will come. It is He who will inherit the nations. Psalm chapter 2 verse 8 says, He will inherit the nations. The very ends of the earth belongs to Jesus. The Psalms tells us that the coming Messiah is not only King and Lord, but that He is also the Son of God, the One who is Creator of all things. Psalm 2 verse 7 and 12 says, I will declare the decree. The Lord Jehovah has said to me, You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. And then verse 12 says, Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him, in the Son, in Jesus. Hebrews 1 verse 10 to 12 says of Christ, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all, will, and all will become like an old, like, like old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. This is a direct quote from Psalm 102 verse 25 to 27 that we find in Hebrews that is directly applied to Jesus Christ. 
And so when we pace our way through the book of Psalms, we find in total 25 different Psalms that foretell the coming of Christ and predict events that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the only righteous man. Psalms 22 predicts that he will be forsaken by God and despised and rejected by his own. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know that those are words that Jesus would say on the cross. And it is quoted for us in Psalms 22 verse 1. Verse 18 says of the same psalm, it says, They divide my garments among them, and, my, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's exactly what the soldiers did at the foot of the cross in Matthew 27 verse 35. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, he is the sacrificial lamb of God, who laid his life down to redeem his people through the offering of his body once for all. That's Psalm 40 verse 6 to 8. And it's quoted in Hebrews 10. Psalm 16 predicts his resurrection and Psalm 110 predicts, declares his exaltation at the right hand of God the Father. So what I want us to see is that the Psalms is filled with Jesus, pointing to Jesus. So as we come to the first Psalm of this book that proclaims the glories of the coming Christ, this magnificent Psalter where one of every six psalms includes at least one messianic prof prophecy. It should be right of us when we read this psalm, Psalm 1, as we open the psalm, which stands as a great majestic door to the entire Psalter. We should expect that at the opening of the doors of this psalm, we should see Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the only righteous man who is blessed forever. Amen? Who else can fit the description of such blessedness? It is he who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Christ is the tree planted by the streams of waters that yields its fruit in its season and whose leaf never withers. In all that he does, he prospers. Christ stands at the door of the Psalms and shows us right at the entrance that the blessedness of the righteous is found only in him. The only righteous one is Jesus Christ. We have no righteousness of our own. He alone is our righteousness. The blessedness of the righteous is found in who Christ is and in what he has done for us. The blessedness of the righteous is not found in what they do, but in who they are. There's a lot of things that we can do that makes us look righteous and good and all of those kind of things. You don't need to be saved to do good things. But our righteousness, the only righteousness we have is in Jesus Christ because He alone is righteous. For He made Him who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him 2nd Corinthians 5 verse 21 the Christian life is not the pursuit to become something that you are not rather because of who you are you become more and more what Christ Jesus is and so as we approach the psalm we should not take from it some moralistic formula of what it is to be blessed. So if I do this, I do that, I do that, I'm going to be blessed. That's not the idea of the psalm. Instead, we should see Christ, who is the tree planted by streams of water, and find our delight in Him. I think that's the point of the first three verses. The blessed man is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. Ultimately, this psalm points to Christ who is the only righteous one who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. Meaning, he meditates on it all the time. But it certainly has application for those who are in Christ. Those who have been declared righteous, justified because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Their pursuit is to become more and more like Christ. That's the pursuit of the believer. We want to become more and more like Christ, the one who has made us righteous. 
And so Psalm 1 verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The righteous are blessed because of who they are in Christ. And the evidence of such blessedness is seen in their pursuit of Christ. It is seen in them following Christ, tracing after Christ. Because of who they are in Christ, they no longer walk in the counsel of the wicked. They no longer throw their weight behind worldly ideas and norms. They don't participate in crooked schemes and follow after the philosophies of the world. They measure and weigh everything against the word of God because their delight is in the law. Because of who they are in Christ, they don't stand in the way of sinners. They don't stink like them. They, they don't behave like them. They don't talk like them. They don't even want to dress like some of them. Sinners are those who willfully miss the mark. They constantly stray from the righteous path. They're not led on the paths of righteousness. In fact, they openly defy God's command and go after their own way. They seek out their own blessedness on their own terms, in their own way. And so, the righteous don't stand in the way of sinners. Those who are in Christ are the blessed. Therefore, we do not seek the things sinners seek. We do not run after the things sinners run after. The way of sinners does not lead to Christ. We run after Christ. Why would we follow a way that takes us away from Christ? We run towards Jesus. We find our blessedness in Christ alone. Because of who the blessed are in Christ, they no longer sit in the seat of scoffers. Scoffers are those who love to criticize God and His people. They never have something good to say about those who want to please God. They always look for something negative in believers. They are enemies of the cross, scoffers of righteousness. So when you want to live godly, they're going to tell you, so man, just loosen up a bit. These are scoffers. They are against righteousness and godliness. But those blessed in Christ are those who love their enemies. They bless those who curse them and bear with them who speak evil of them. They bless the scoffers. Christ has taken their scoffing upon himself and has given them a gospel to proclaim. So instead of joining the scoffers, they join Jesus in preaching the gospel. Instead of joining those who are on an a, a, a unrighteous path, who defy Jesus, who defy Christ, and who scoffs goodness, they preach the gospel. They point people to Jesus. The first verse of the psalm shows us what a man blessed in Christ will not do because of who he is in Christ. There is a way he will not walk in. There's a path he will not stand in and a seat he will not sit in because his meditation and delight is in God's law of which Christ is the fulfillment. So if I want to see whether you are on the righteous path, I must see certain things that you will not do. Even though everybody else is doing it, there are certain things that the believer, the one who is righteous in Christ, will not do. There's a way he will not walk, a seat he will not sit in. Because he looks to Jesus, the author and the finisher of his faith. Now coming to verse 4, we are introduced to the great contrast between the blessed man, who is referred to as the righteous in the last two verses, and the wicked. Verse 4 says, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The psalm shows us two, and only two ways of living. There's no middle ground here. No compromise, no gray area. You know, we, we always hear, find the middle ground. Come to the gray area, brother. You are too like that. Now, this psalm is like that. 
It's black and white. Two areas, two ways of living. You're either the righteous who are blessed or you are the wicked who are condemned. You like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season or you are like chaff that the wind drives away. And so Psalm 1 shows us that ultimately there are only two ways and ultimately there are only two types of people. The righteous and the wicked. Both do what they do and live the way they live because of who they are. Their condition determines what they pursue and delight in and ultimately what their final destiny will be. The righteous pursue the path of blessing, relying on Jesus in whom they delight, who alone has walked the path for them. Their dependence is on Him, not in any works of their own. They prosper in all that they do. Romans 8.28 yeah? All things work together for good for them that love the Lord, who are called according to His purpose. That's the righteous. But the wicked are not so. We see there in verse 4, the wicked are not so. This is such a blunt and definitive statement, isn't it? The wicked are not so. It's almost like a conclusion, it's just like that. The wicked are not so. Now, this statement doesn't even allow you to pause and wonder about those seemingly blessed things that the wicked enjoy. There's no speculation about their temporal pleasures. Proverbs 6 verse 4 says, The Lord has made all for Himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. Do you get that? It's almost like people don't like this kind of, they don't like these kind of scriptures in the Bible. This they don't like. The wicked are all those outside of Christ. The wicked are not Satanists. Or only Satanists. The wicked is the, the nice granny opposite that lives with you that wants nothing to do with God. That's the wicked. The wicked are those people who say, yeah, but I'm a good person, but they've never received Jesus Christ. The wicked are those outside of Jesus. They're not believers, they're not saved. I don't see but theory. You get? They're not transformed by the grace of Christ. That's the wicked. So if you are confused about it, I just want to make it plain who the wicked are. Sometimes we think the wicked are the crooked witch or witch doctor or something like that. No, no. The wicked are those who reject Jesus as Savior and as Lord and do not submit and follow Him. It says the wicked are not so. Proverbs 6 verse 4. Listen, the Bible says this. Write it down, read it for yourself. The Lord has made all for Himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. Wow. Now, remember the Psalm of Asaph, Psalm 73. Verse 3 to 4 in Psalm 73, it says, Asaph was wondering about the wicked. Listen to what he says. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Hmm. I used to be seeing the wicked prospering, like we see today. They're having a good time, like they've got no sorrows, no problem. Verse 4 says, For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. That's what Isaac says. But in Psalm 1, before you can come up with any objection as to the prosperity of the wicked, the psalmist immediately shows you the fleeting and ultimate abrupt end of the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Now you know what chaff is? Chaff is the leftover part of the grain. It's the dry skin of the kernel. The parts of the kernel that you don't, you don't eat that part. It's, let me make a, an easier uh, 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 um, example. It is like a mealy. Yeah? The mealy. It's got a husk around it. You have to take off the husk to, be, to eat the mealy. That husk 
is chaff. That's the part you throw away. That is what the wicked are like. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Similar to the parable of Jesus in Matthew 13, where harvest time pointed towards the coming judgment of the wicked, we read, And at harvest time, this is Matthew 13 verse 30, And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Like chaff and weeds, the wicked will also find themselves cast into the furnace of God's wrath. There will be weeping and a gnashing of teeth there, Jesus says. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. How can the wicked stand in the judgment of Almighty God? Think you'll be able to stand? I've heard people telling me, no, but when we're in judgment, I'm going to explain to God. I'll ask Him for forgiveness, and it's His job to forgive. Because He's God. He's a good God. See, because He is a good God, He must judge you righteously. And if anyone is found whose name is not written in the land book of life, he'll be cast into the fiery furnace with Satan and his demons. I mean, how long will chaff last before the blazing heat of a holy God who is a consuming fire? Listen to how Malachi describes the day of God's judgment in Malachi 4 verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. This is the destiny of the wicked. They will have no part whatsoever in the fellowship of God's people on that day, great day of judgment. Listen to how the psalm ends in verse 6. It says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the righteous is after the one they delight in. He is the one that the law points to. The Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. This is Jesus. But the way of the wicked is a life that is lived independent from Christ. It's a life of self-indulgence and worldliness. A life without Christ. If you are not a born-again follower of Christ, you are the wicked. Now notice that the psalm does not ask for a response or an opinion. Neither does it offer any solutions. It simply and clearly shows us two ways of living that is the result of the condition of two types of people, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. The important question that screams for attention in the psalm is this. Which of the two paths are you on? Are you on the way of the righteous or on the way of the wicked? Which path are you on? In Matthew 7, Jesus uses the same type of analogy to show the contrast between righteous and the wicked. Christ refers to two types of trees. A healthy tree and an unhealthy tree. Healthy trees bears good fruit and unhealthy trees bears bad fruit. That's obvious. The trees that does not bear good fruit, Jesus says, will be cut down and thrown in the fire. And so the question begs, what kind of tree are you? If Christ should examine your life tonight, will he find good fruit on your tree? Because you are planted in him? Or is your tree filled with self-righteous fruits that is not produced by the righteous one, Jesus Christ? You might be sitting here this evening and upon examination of your own life, you might even sit there and really find, really come to a conclusion, I am on the path of the wicked. 
You know who you are before Christ. Every unbeliever knows that they're not following Christ. Even when they say it with their mouths. They know it. You know. It doesn't matter which church you belong to. And by the way, tonight is not to be invited to join our church. Christ is the one that brings people to the church. Tonight is to have you examine your own self. I want you to see Jesus. And look at yourself before this holy God. Ask yourself the question. What kind of tree am I? Which path am I on? Am I the righteous or am I the wicked? What kind of fruit am I producing? Is my fruit coming because of my dependency on Christ? Because I'm following Him? Or is the fruit that I'm producing just fruit that comes out of my daily self-sustaining life that I have without Jesus, without God? Listen to what Jesus says in verse 13 and 14 of Matthew 7. He says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. Many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Are you among the few or are you among the many? Here's the good news. Jesus made a way for you to enter by the narrow gate that leads to life. He made a way. He made a way for the wicked to be made righteous. In fact, all of us that are believers today, me standing here, I used to be the wicked. But Jesus made a way for me to be the righteous. Not because I now suddenly have righteous works, but because of His righteousness. He made a way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. He is the tree planted by the streams of waters, and He is offering abundant life to all those who will trust in Him. We're at the third month now, it's March, né? third month of 2022. And I'm sure many of you sitting here tonight have already forgotten the New Year's resolutions that you made in the beginning of the year, in January. You know, the first of January, we all make New Year's resolutions. And so we promise ourselves that we will do better this year. I'm going to do better this year. I'm going to turn a new page. We want to change our lives for the better, and somehow we think, a change of lifestyle will improve our lives. Listen to me. You don't need an improved life. You need a new heart. Nothing can change and improve your life if your heart is not being renewed. The only improvement that you can have with that old heart of stone is weed. Growing faster and bigger, providing more wood for the fire. You need a savior, not just a change of lifestyle. Jesus came to save you from your sins. He came to change you. He came to change who you are. You don't have to be like chaff that the wind blows away. You don't have to be like the weeds that will be gathered together and thrown into hell. You don't have to die in your sin. Take heed to what the scripture says. The way of the wicked will perish. It will. It maybe didn't perish yet, but it will. We all going to come to an end. Verse 6 says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The way of the righteous is the way of the cross. It was at the cross that Jesus paid with his blood for your sins. At the cross, Jesus overcame death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus overcame it on the cross. At the cross, he traded his righteousness for your sins. On the cross, he was rejected so that you can be accepted into the household of God. At the cross, he made a way for you 
to be counted among the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So tonight, even as you hear the gospel, as you hear the good news of Jesus, and as you've heard the bad news of your own life without Christ, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Put your trust in Him now. It does not have to be an altar call, a sinner's prayer. You can come to Jesus now. Where you are, call upon the name of the Lord. Ask Jesus to forgive you, to receive you, to accept you, to make you His own. He died for that. Died for your sins. And was raised again on the third day, overcoming death and defeating the devil. And now He's offering everyone that would come to Him in faith and repentance, He's offering you eternal life. If you would only come. Believe on Him. He alone can save you. You can't save yourself. Your church cannot save you. No church can save anybody. A pastor, a priest, an apostle, or a bishop, whatever they call themselves today, they cannot save you. Salvation is not found in anybody on this earth. We are all sinners. Salvation is only in Jesus Christ alone. Run to Christ. Before I close in prayer, Won't you take a moment to consider this question with me? Which way are you on? On what path are you? What kind of tree are you? Are you on the path of the righteous or on the wicked? Are you on the narrow way or on the broad way? Consider your life before Jesus, before a holy God. Consider your soul. Your soul. Consider it right now before the Lord. Won't you close your eyes where you are seated and consider the condition of your soul before Holy God. He will not let the wicked go unpunished, but his arms are open to receive those who come to him. And if you know you're on the wrong way, you have an opportunity right now to ask God to forgive you and to save you. Just call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of Jesus and ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to save you, to change your life. You should do it now before it's too late. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this moment that you have given us to examine our lives before you. You have ordered the steps of every single person here tonight. You brought them to this place to hear your gospel. You brought them to this place to examine their own lives, to see which path they are on. You showed them Jesus. You showed them the way out, O oh God. Now we pray in the name of Jesus. Draw them to Jesus. Save sinners. So that they too might know what it is to be called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen.